You are listening to CEO Perspectives, a podcast by the Conference Board. Welcome to this episode of CEO Perspectives, a signature webcast and podcast series by the Conference Board. CEO Perspectives take an objective, nonpartisan look at a range of topics that matter most to business leaders. We'll talk to experts on a variety of topics that matter most. In this series, we'll do what we do best at the conference board, which is to provide trusted insights for what's ahead. I'm Steve Odlin, the CEO of the conference board and the host of this series. And in today's conversation, we'll be discussing what's next in this war with Ukraine. What is Russia planning? How should the US and NATO prepare for what may come? I'm so pleased today to invite our guest, General Jim Huggins, who now is a partner at the McChrystal Group, but formerly three-star Lieutenant General, former Chief Operating Officer, United States Army, and an expert on all of these things. Jim, welcome to the show. Thanks very much for the introduction. Very, very kind. So, you know, for our listeners, Jim, you know, you're retired from the Army. You're, you know, you're not going to share with us national secrets today, but, you know, you you really have spent your whole career uh, you know, it, just in the thick of these kinds of situations, you understand more than I think most business leaders about it. And that's really what we're trying to do is just get your judgment and your best guess about, about what's going on. So as you look at this Russia-Ukraine situation today, you know, what do you think Russia was trying to accomplish? Um, and, you know, what is your judgment about where that is, how successful that's been? Thanks, Steve. I would uh, I'd really start off saying, you know, as sort of a caveat up front, m- military goals, uh, objectives in conflict um, usually have political ends that tie into that. So, you know, militarily, I'm not sure what all the objectives are in terms of what they're trying to do. Um, I could, you know, guess at what they're really trying to do. But politically, the issue becomes on the 24th of February when um, when Russia invaded, you know, what were the governments, maybe what were more specifically Putin's aims? Um, you know, what was said nationally, internationally, was really trying to maybe reunite the Soviet Union, taking a step forward. Maybe that is what Putin's legacy is about that. And it's also maybe ensuring, you know, Ukraine's neutral status, or we could take it down the line of, is it economically driven because of the natural resources that exist more than just gas in the country of Ukraine with its pretty large um, surface area and uh, a fairly significant amount of natural resources um, that would be valuable to the world. So those are sort of the factors that are out there. If you ask me how it's gone, I would say the travesties, the the horrific pain that the people of Ukraine are feeling um, goes at the top of the the list of regrets. But um, another regret seems to be that I would assess it as a lot of political mistakes made in terms of uh, on the part of Russia, in terms of what what they thought would happen. Um, And guess what? I'm not casting a really bad dispersion on him, Steve, because militarily, I think the only thing we could say consistently all militaries do is they don't predict the outcomes really well. It just doesn't, because again, it's a political outcome we're trying to achieve. We've never been good at predicting what the next conflict would be or how the conflict would end. Um, Maybe Afghanistan and Iraq are in the back of my mind also. So I think it's not been a success story in terms of Russia's aims they certainly aren't going to give up, but I don't think it's been a success. So I, I think I think your point is really good. It starts with the political objectives and the political objectives here. And then, I, you know, I don't think President Putin has been shy about saying that he, you know, his desire is to put back the former USSR or the states and, and you know, the Russian empire and, and its prominence in the world. But, you, you know, you also have to look at the Crimean situation. I mean, he waltz into Crimea in, you know, a few years ago as a and took that over and, you know, frankly, received very little resistance from either Ukraine or the West. And so, you know, this Black Sea access and, you know, the the land bridge to that seems to be uh, also a military objective here. So do you think, you know, if, if you're looking at it from a military perspective, 
you know, obviously it hasn't achieved what what they expected, but do you see sort of a, a, a retreat back to trying to secure Crimea and, and then, uh, you know, a land bridge through the Donbass region? A large belief, um, both of us in the military, and I'm sure um, those that listen to you, to your podcast and webcast would probably say, um, Putin has an escalate to de-escalate strategy. Um, he's used that in the past in other areas. That would fit the scenario that you just described. I don't think that's as viable anymore, given the atrocities that have gone on. I think the international community probably is uh, drawing a much stiffer line on, on the outcome on this one, my personal opinion. Yeah, yeah it, it, and it, it, you know, it's clear I, it, that he's been isolated. But you know, if if you were if you were on the other side and you were in, you'd given the objective, the political objective of taking over Ukraine, invading Ukraine, um, you know, and as you look at how they prosecuted it, you know, they they it wasn't any secret. I mean, they they were you know staging on the border for for months. I mean, it was clear in all of the you know the satellite photos and everything. And then you hear rumors that, you know, the the initial force were carrying dress uniforms with them, meaning that they didn't expect this to go long. And, you know, they were going to do some sort of quick parade, you know, in the first week. So none of that happened. You know, how would you have done this differently? You know, it, you know, it seems to me when we go in, we we lead with air power and, you know, try to take out, you know, infrastructure and so forth before we say that's not the way they they did this militarily. Yeah, I think there was a, a big assumption um, that it was going to be a cakewalk. And I think that proved to be a rather fatal flaw. Um, I think it's a lesson that you know we, even post the military for me, being lucky enough to work in the private sector and corporate world, you know, when you hedge every option, everything you're you're trying to go for on, on one course of action, um, maybe you should relook that. Um, and I really don't think there was much of a request. I think um, I think politically there was a decision made uh, militarily. The assumption was made that everything would sort of fall by the wayside. And this would be one of those very, very quick um, wars. And then we would potentially de-escalate um, and settle, as you had said, up front. Um, if you're asking me, hindsight being 2020, you, you always plan for success and you always plan for failure. In other words, what we what we try to do is develop branches and sequels that say, okay, should this fail, what would be our next recourse? Um, the other piece is, is you know, maybe posturing a second force that possibly could have supported the first, as opposed to one drive, which was supposed to sort of cut through, seize, and then be done. Now, those are all speculations, Steve, but. In other words, never putting all your eggs in one basket. And I think, again, this, you know, your listeners can relate to that, whether it's military or in terms of you know, restructures, mergers and acquisitions, there's always another option that could happen. You know, it's interesting. You know, I, I'm not a military expert. You are. But, you know, I, I was a little surprised they led with infantry and, you know, and, and you know, on the ground movement uh, rather than you know, air support and, and airstrikes first. I mean, it, it just seems logical that if, you're, if your goals are to take over a certain territory that you, were, you know, were you surprised at, at how they, they did this? I mean, they, they, it's not that they don't have those resources, right? It's not. Um, I think that goes back to the flawed assumption that it would just be a cakewalk and they would move in. I mean, this is, after all, this is Russia. You know, it's the behemoth and it's going to just, roll through. Unfortunately, that did, that did not deter the, the, the incredible people in the country, Ukraine. And, you know, certainly if it was a U.S. military piece, um, we probably, as you have seen in the past, we probably would have started more with an intelligence phase in terms of assessing, no kidding, trying to make an intel uh, assessment of what the fight would look like, then maybe attacking strategic targets from over the horizon. You know, in our case, those would not have been civilian populations. Obviously, in theirs, it was a different piece. Um, and then exploitation following that initial softening um, with the with perhaps air power or, you know, other other aerial. They certainly have enough artillery to do anything they'd like also. Yeah. So that goes back to your to your point is, you know, that would have been a logical way to do it. And, the, and so therefore you know, almost the only conclusion you can get to is that they expected this to be a cakewalk and maybe even that they would be invited in 
uh, you know, there's there's been some reports that they expected to do military parades, the, you know, the con you know, the, the liberating heroes kind of thing. And, you know, that that clearly was a, a miscalculation. So now, you know, it's it's very dangerous because, you know, Russia does not and, and President Putin in particular does not want to be embarrassed. This has been somewhat embarrassing. You have to I mean, by any by any measure. You know, when you back somebody in a corner, you know, it, it creates a dangerous situation. So do you, you know, what are your worries about, you know, escalation now from here? My wife has a very interesting discussion sometimes when we don't agree on a point. And her comment to me is, Jim, you can't rationalize with an irrational person. I know she can't be talking about me, but I guess she was. Um, <laughs> well, I've met, I've met your wife. So, you know, she, she could have been talking about just about anybody. Yeah, well, I mean, I think I have the T-shirt, so I try to look outward with it. And in this case, you know, I would apply it to the leadership um, over there. Um, it is hard to predict when it is so irrational, when when the nature of what they're trying to do is just unconscionable to most of us. If they are as devout to their military objectives and perhaps in the overall strategy for Ukraine, and that becomes eminent failure, would that then predicate an escalation, um, whether it be chemical or whether it be nuclear? Certainly, we know they have the capability. But the real question is, is what's the deterrent? And if that is applied, what would be the recourse for all involved? And, and we, I think that would be pretty tragic for all whale. A rational person would say nobody would go to that measure. My concern is I'm not sure they're rational at this point in time. It's probably the closest, in my estimation, I've seen the world at coming to World War III. So, you know, is your view that the chemical weapon use, at least, you know, from a tactical standpoint in Ukraine is possible? Certainly possible. I'm not, I'm going to not go to probable. It's possible. And I think the strategy of our leaders and the NATO leaders is trying to make sure is, is that, where was that, where will that line be drawn? And I don't know where that line is, but um, again, it's going to be action, reaction, counteraction. What will predicate such an act? Um, but at the same point in time, it's probably unacceptable to walk away from this from NATO and, and the United States perspective at this point in time. So then is time on our side? I, I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, on the other hand, you know, it's been what, more than three months and they have not resorted to the use of chemical or tactical nuclear weapons, which kind of makes you think, well, gee, if they were going to do it, wouldn't they have done it by now? Again, you're irrational, and I'm trying to be rational. I, <laughs> I, I agree, I go wholeheartedly I agree, but I don't, I would not, I, would, I don't think our leaders and NATO leaders are making that assumption carte blanche, just like the failed assumption made by Russia, probably that this would be a cakewalk and they would be welcomed in as liberators. I think we, we've got to guard against crossing a line, creating an action that is going to cause someone who has been put back on their heels, someone maybe has been embarrassed by the outcome to take an irrational measure. Yeah. And, you know, our own politicians, you know, not not just the U.S., but the Western politicians have been very careful not to draw red lines, you know, which I think probably is a smart thing. I hope is a smart thing, uh, you know, so as not to back anyone into any corners, including ourselves. But, you know, if if the goal is to, you know, reform, you know, the old Soviet Union, obviously the Baltic states now are part of NATO, and they were part of the Soviet Union before. You also have Moldova, which is uh, south of Ukraine, which is not a, a NATO state, but is, you know, was part of it. What, you know, so if, if he's going to escalate, does he escalate beyond Ukraine and take action somewhere in, you know, the, the Baltic states or Poland or, you know, create a corridor for you know, for his, you know, for his base in Kaliningrad, you know, so what are the possibilities militarily that you see? I, I would back up militarily one level and say that, you know, there perhaps there is another assumption that was made um, in terms of the military um, invasion um, that is not a political assumption that said, oh, the war will be over in a short period of time, but maybe another assumption that said, 
um, our military is really good and really capable. And I'm not sure that's a valid assumption. The Russian military is really valid in terms of resourcing, in terms of training. Maybe they couldn't do the air campaign because of other issues. You know, maybe the artillery isn't as good as it was, although they are just leveling cities. And, you know, certainly the tactics used could all be questioned. And so, again, if you talk a bigger scale across all the Baltic states and what his goals are, if what happened in Ukraine is reflective of the competency and capability within the Russian military, I don't think you can go to that level unless you see an ex escalation, as tragic as that may sound. Does that make sense, Steve? Yeah, and 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 then it goes to well, if you you know, it it seems to me if you're prosecuting one poorly, why would you start and you know want to do two poorly? Is I think that's if I could summarize what what you what you're saying. So so basically, that does what I hear you saying is militarily, it does suggest that they will focus, it, you know, logically on Ukraine until they get some sort of you know outcome or at least visibility to an outcome that is desirable in that. It, I, did I summarize that fairly? I think so. And unless, you know, we were talking about the escalation. And, and I think the only other alternative you had, if you were going to hit that desperate measure, would be escalation. Yeah. Um, because, again, I mean, I know um, you and I had spoken about NATO before. I mean, that, therein lies, you know, how much of that is in Putin and the Russian calculation about Ukraine? Is it just Ukraine? Is it just natural resources? Is it, you know, is it the... Is it reunifying the former Soviet Union? Um, and if it is that, then, um, you know, the fact since 1997, 14 countries have, in that area have gone into NATO. And then what's next? And what's next? And what's next? Um, and, and again, it could lead into the calculation of, of the leadership of Russia going, OK, we're drawing the line here. Yeah. Fascinating. All right. We've talked about Russia's goals and what they might do next to achieve them. We're going to take a short break and be right back with my conversation with General Huggins. As war rages in Ukraine, the Conference Board is closely monitoring the situation and producing timely and relevant content on a daily basis that will help the business community navigate this global geopolitical unrest. What will the impact be on oil prices, food prices, our supply chain? And what about cybersecurity? How will this conflict impact the way your organization does business around the world? And how will you communicate this crisis to customers and employees? We're gathering the very latest content on our website. Just head to conference-board.org and find trusted insights to help you and your team lead with confidence. Welcome back to CEO Perspectives. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Conference Board, and I'm joined today by retired General Jim Huggins, who's a partner at the McChrystal Group and the former Chief Operating Officer of the U.S. Army. So. Jim, you know, we have to talk about, you know, the recent applications uh, to NATO by Finland and, and Sweden, because this was something that that Russia desperately did not want to happen. And yet their actions in Ukraine have now stimulated precisely the, the thing that they didn't want to happen. And they warned early that if anybody was contemplating joining NATO, it would result in severe repercussions. And there was some discussion of whether that would include nuclear. And then this week, President Putin has said, well, OK, we're not worried about Finland and Sweden joining NATO. What what is that all about? I mean, and change the narrative, because he, he obviously, again, much like the poorly executed, maybe poorly planned invasion, a lot of uh, pontification, maybe uh, um, grandstanding in the beginning that would hopefully send a message where that would uh, influence people not to take that next step actually backfire. Um, and now they have no recourse but to come back and say, wasn't that big a deal? Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it basically is a logical and it's a good thing. But then they've also said, but don't put any more any weapons, you know, or, you know, missile batteries or anything into those states. And you know who knows. I, so it 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 sounds like they're dealing from a position of weakness at this point, but they have not taken that opportunity to escalate, as we were saying before. Which I don't know. Do, do you agree that that should be interpreted as good news? 
Boy, that is a, that's a that's a really tough question, <laughs> Steve. Um, you know, my gut, my heart tells me yes, that's a good that good news. In my mind, I'm going through second and third order effects. If it's all about trying to help um, all of us trying to sleep better at night, I would say that's good news. Um, but yet, um, there's a part of me that is making myself ask my you know second guess and say, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Or is there a is there a second strategy? Does he have another card up his sleeve in terms of what he's trying to do? But my my initial gut, probably driven by my heart, says it's good news. Yeah, but militarily, you know, your point is you, you can't just say, oh, okay, check, it's fine, everything's. You have to always contingency plan and say, well, what 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 else could he be doing here? Because if he if he caved this easily, does it mean that you know he really is going to take some other action? And I think we always have to be be thinking about those those possibilities. I, I want to pivot now to China and India because you know it was it is interesting that uh, you know right before the Olympics, President Putin and President Xi of China got together and and you know bonded. Now they're they're best friends and they've got all these agreements and economic agreements. And then uh, Prime Minister Modi and President Putin also got together in December and you know signed a bunch of agreements. So you know how does from a military perspective how should the U.S. and NATO view this new axis? Is it a simply an economic axis of convenience in order to you know have you know trade be able to flow you know in case of the sanctions yada yada, or is this a military an increased military threat? You know, I, you know, I would you and I've talked about it again. I, I I wish I was in a position to absolutely know, but my speculation is is it is not an increased military threat. I think, especially with the situation in China, you know, there's a friendship, but I don't think it's a friendship without limits. Um, and I think, you know, there, if there's speculation about what what you what Ukraine situation and Russia mean to what China and Taiwan mean, I mean, I'm not sure there's a great corollary to tie into that right off the bat along the way, but that, that's probably another discussion. So I think... Certainly in terms of military sales, it was a financially beneficial agreement and friendship. Um, now, I also know that it's, it's public record that the, mili the U.S. military, the United States, is trying to intervene in terms of, you know, what could we do um, to try to change uh, at least India's perspective in terms of foreign military sales and, and weapons purchases. China will never be the case, probably, but I still think that's not a friendship without limits. Yeah, and and the China India situation is it, you know is fraught with history. You know they've they've they share a common border. They've had disputed you know disputed border lines and you know conflicts ar around that for a long time. So they're not exactly friends. So this seems more like two bilateral independent bilateral agreements between you know Russia and China and Russia and India just you know in order to keep. The, the economic things going. But you also have, what now, three carrier groups active, U.S. carrier groups active, um, you know, in, in outside of China, you know, south of Japan and, and uh, around Taiwan. Describe militarily what your interpretation, again, you, you're not there, you don't know, but what would be your interpretation of those actions? So um, militaries typically exist to um, fight and win our nation's wars. Um, but the military also has a very significant shape and deter functions. Um, we'd actually prefer not to go to war, as strange as that may sound. I think you know that and your listeners know that. I, I do believe this is in terms of engagement, trying to shape. Um, and I think it's not just about the United States. It's also about trying to bolster the coalition and our allies um, in the world, around the world, especially in that part of the world along the way. You know, I don't know what is in the minds of um, the governments in the area. Um, certainly, there's probably questions, and there's no assurance that nothing bad will not happen. But the more prepared those forces are and those nations are, I think that's the best way to sort of, um, as I used to say, ward off evil. So China's intent towards Taiwan is has not been veiled. Uh, they view it as one China. They view it as sort of a breakaway province. Um, but, you know, the rest of the world sort of views it as an independent country, even if their, you know, their formal diplomatic policy is the one China policy. Do you think that China will take military action to 
to re-annex Taiwan? I believe that the president probably sees uh, of China sees um, his legacy tied to this action. The question is, is at what cost? And I don't think that internationally, this is probably in his calculation, um, the right time. Um, I don't know what the future calculation will be, but I do know that, you know, so, you know, overall, what are China's goals? Not just Taiwan, but let's consider the bigger factor. And, you know, you just have to look at their economy and what they're doing. So if you take such an action, will the same constraints be applied to China that we're applying to Russia at this point in time? That's got to be in the back of President Xi's mind. So I don't think so now. Yeah, that's and it's interesting because I suspect that your answer would have been different in February, because when they first got together, they kind of agreed, okay, you know, we're not going to criticize you on Ukraine if you don't criticize us as it relates to Taiwan. And of course, there were, the actions in the in the UN were were relatively neutral. So, but I, I think if you're President Xi, who is a very smart person. Um, and understands that he that he needs to you know he needs to engage globally and economically and he's you know he's the world's manufacturing site at the moment that those same actions or those same kind of sanctions against China would would really be crippling and therefore threaten his own power I you know I would imagine so you know I it's whenever we talk you always are are very clear that it always starts with the political objectives and I think that's so important for people to understand. Um, so in this case, the political objectives suggest that, you know, if if they do take action, as Russia did, you know, with some sort of kinetic action, that it would not end up favorably and it wouldn't it wouldn't land them in the political spot that they wanted. Is it you know, if is, would you would you agree with that analysis? 100 percent. Yeah, 100 percent. So so then it would suggest that that it's less likely today that there's kinetic action then then maybe there there was three or four months ago um and, and i guess maybe that's a positive but there's a reason why those carrier groups are there because they don't want to assume you don't want to rest on jim huggins assumption along the way and uh I, I i could not second guess any of that and i think it's very prudent in terms of what um the nation the pacific command and uh and the forces they were doing yeah, and then of course you've got North Korea in there that uh, you know wants to stay relevant by lobbing missiles towards towards the east, and you know so you know it's always a wild card in there as well. So it, it's a few months too early for that right now, but it it is like clockwork, Steve. It, it's it sure seems to be. General Huggins, this has been you know a terrific conversation, and it, you really do appreciate you know your your sharing with us you know your analysis from a military perspective today. It's my pleasure. Thank you very, very much, Steve. And thanks to all of you for listening into CEO Perspectives. Every week, I'll be joined by a prominent thought leader to provide insights into the issues of our times. We'll cover leading topics in geopolitics, economics, public policy, ESG, and more. Please share CEO Perspectives with your colleagues wherever they are, because I know they're going to want to listen. I'm Steve Odlin, and this webcast and podcast have been brought to you by the Conference Board. You've been listening to a podcast from the Conference Board, your source of trusted insights for what's ahead. For the latest insights to help guide your business through this time of geopolitical unrest, we have daily and relevant updates on our website at conference-board.org.